So I said to, to my guy, I said, you walk in, you talk to that supplier, and I'm going to be standing right behind you, bite my tongue, because I am dying to come over the top at him. If he tries any sort of bullshit, I'm like right there. Hi everyone, welcome to the Business for Builders podcast. My name's Max, uh, I'm the Smith & Son CEO here in Canada. Welcome to you if you're uh, watching this on YouTube. Uh, today, a uh, bit of a trick. Uh, we have got a recording of a Q&A. Now, it went for about an hour, so uh, you might be in for a bit of a long haul here, but some really good information, some good questions were asked. Uh, and we had, we had a terrific audience of folks uh, in the building game that were really asking some per per pertinent pertinent questions. And so uh, hang around, enjoy this. Be sure to email me, uh, max at businessforbuilders.ca or hit the website, businessforbuilders.ca, hit the contact form. One thing I didn't mention in the show was the uh, Business for Builders VIP private Facebook group. Get across there if you're a good sort. Um, I'll let you in. And uh, it's a great place uh, for a bit of community and collaboration. Now, are we going to get cracking on... Uh, you're, what was the right. first question that was... There was a question that's now gone. Which one was that? It was Peter. Go. Cool. Uh, Peter from TikTok, what is the biggest expense for a business? Mate, I think, Peter, thanks for your question, champion. Mate, I, it's definitely, without fail, and I was going to start banging on about this because I, I actually was, I had a nightmare. I thought nobody's going to show up for my Q&A show. And uh, here, here all you folks are, so it's awesome to see you again. But um, the most expensive in, in your business by far is, is human resource. Uh, and I was going to kick off this show with a little bit of a spiel as I'm driving. It's funny, I was on a site today with my builder and one of his guys, and you know, um, we, we sort of talk a lot about human resource because by far, I can buy a nail gun or a trailer or an excavator or whatever, and usually it'll, it, it won't give me any shit and won't really cost me money just for sitting there, but um, humans by far are the biggest challenge. So Peter, I would say the the, the, the the biggest cost to any business is your labor. Um, and so what I was going to lead out with was like, you know, I was talking to my general contractor today. And of course, it's the same for me as a franchisor. When I'm talking to general contractors about, hey, do you want to join the Smith & Sons group and uh, become one of the Smith & Sons general contractors? It's the same for me recruiting uh, general contractors or builders because a lot of people, you know, you know, they pretend to be one thing and they're another, and then they really don't. Um, they really don't end up, you know, showing what they were talking about. So, uh, what you've got to do, Pete, um, to make sure you're getting your biggest bang for your buck. I don't know why I'm holding on my business card for. <laughs> Get some <laughs> is, extra business. Is uh, what you've got to do is you've got to have a balance between. Um, you've got to have a balance when we're talking humans, right? You've got to have a balance between. Um, the person being a good human and having great skills. So here I am, I'm up on the tools, right? That's why I got a bit of sun, which is bloody awesome. And uh, and I'm cursing this guy that that Mike had working for him because he did a really freaking ordinary job. And uh, and so, you know, but he was a really nice guy. He's a really hungry young kid, um, but just didn't have the skills, you know? So shit, it's, it's really a, a case of, you know, probably hire them on the fact that they're a good human and a cultural fit. Um, but then you've really got to double down and visit the site every day if he's by or her is by her him or self, himself, herself, and make sure that the quality of work, because I'm telling you this, I could just tell it's, I, it's, it's kind of weird in Canada, like where I came from and there's CVM, I, can't, I haven't got a name there, but CVM's like, I'm working on a, you know, uh, uh, a Philip Usher construction site, which is the guy I did my apprenticeship with. And it's like, mate, I spent so much time working under several really good carpenters that it actually, it, it just, it just taught me really well on how to build a house and, you know, how to do carpentry, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, hanging out with a builder, doing my apprenticeship with a builder instead of just a carpenter, I got access to all the different trades, the sparkies, the electricians, the concreters, the tile setters, you know, tilers or jip rockers or drywallers or whatever. So, um, you know, I got some good training, whereas here I don't see as much of that. A lot of guys will get their red seal or their credential as a carpenter, but they'll do it with working for a bunch of different folks. And unfortunately, uh, in this country, you can get off the boat because I did it. You can go and get a pickup truck and a bunch of tools and you can go and trade and work directly for the public, which in Australia, all my Aussie friends, particularly Queensland, 
will know that you cannot go and work directly for a homeowner for work outside your skill set, i.e. if you're a carpenter, you can do decks maybe up to a certain amount or is it yeah over 3300 bucks? I don't know, I'm not sure the rules. But here, you can just go and start and it's reckless. It's really bad. And this guy was making, I was tidying up the work that he was doing and I'm looking at this going, a really good carpenter should not be making these, like some of the gaps were big. We're doing a hardy plank weatherboard outside and uh, in Australia, we don't get painted versions unless some of the Aussies want to chime in and tell me they do get uh, painted hardy plank. But over here, guys and girls, and any of those folks in New Zealand or Oz, they do pre-painted. The shit's painted. So when you cut it, it's painted, you install it. And then what you've got to do is you've got to cork it. And uh, we were corking some really big gaps and we're like, oh my God. So that's that's where I'd say, Pete, human resources is your basic, biggest expense, both in the cost per week, but also if you hire the wrong person, maybe they're a good person, but they've got bad skills. Um, they're just going to create all kinds of work like we were doing today. We were absolutely just cursing him all freaking day. Uh, nice guy, just bad skills. But anyway, hope that helps, Pete. That's, uh, that's what I would say, mate. Um, yeah, boom. What's, uh, what's the next question, Dom? Jo Joshua. I hey, got, Joshua. Thanks for the question, champ. I got my cert for it in construction yep. now, taking up a carpentry apprenticeship, trying to get my, trying to get my builders. builders Any tips? Yeah, look, mate, I think the same thing that I would tell all, all youngsters is that you got time. I'm freaking, I just turned 50, right? So I'm old as, but it seems like yesterday I was a shit kicking apprentice for Phil Usher and, um, mate, I don't know where that 30 years has gone, but it is gone. Um, so, look, I think the best thing you can do, as if I was talking to me as a, as a young guy at age, say, 20 after I'd finished my apprenticeship, then we went out and got my Cert 4. So I'm like, okay, I'm in position. I've got my – I think you will have to do two years supervisory experience before you can go and apply for your builder's license. Um, so you've just – what you want to do is you want to steal with your eyes and ears. Something I learned recently was – um, oh, it was R and D, which is normally research and development. Uh, but what was it? Oh, it was a real estate term. Something in duplicate, rip off and duplicate. So what you want to do is you want to work for a builder and really find what the things that they do well, or identify the things they don't do particularly well, and try and figure out how to do that better for yourself. And then when you're in position, you, it's all about your education and your understanding. Because if if you go out there, this is what I thought. I thought, well, I've got a carpentry joinery license. I got my builder's license. Oh, it's guaranteed I'm going to make money. But there was so much shit that I did not know about uh, business development, uh, financial management, and he human resource management. Those were the, the largest. Two. So how do I go about developing a business? How do I uh, keep my eye on the financial component of my business? And how do I recruit humans? Because I know I can't do all this shit by myself if I want to go and scale up a business. Now, if you just want to do quarter of a million, 300,000 a year, and you just want to do your own thing as a one-man band, like it's probably not as critical. But if you say, I want to go and build a $1.5, $3 million business, you're going to need humans. So, and you're going to have bigger numbers, and then you've got to understand business development fundamentals. So, mate, I would say getting your credential, I think I would say this, the easiest thing that I ever did was go and get my builder's license. The hardest thing I ever did was go and make money uh, and be, be a successful business person and run a successful business by far, because, you know, everything changes all the time. Like, that's why I say business is an infinite game. Have a quiet year this year where you're getting the foundation sorted out within your business, within yourself. Be educating, always be growing. Uh, and then go and say, right, next year I'm going to go and launch. And so this is why I think really a business coach is good. But if you've got a business coach who knows nothing about construction, it's going to be not so good. So, um, yeah, just, you know, this is why guys and girls, I'm more than happy to hate take emails from you guys, max at uh, businessforbuilders.ca or go to the businessforbuilders.ca website, click, go through that contact page, it'll end up on my phone and I can come back to you via email if you've got some specifics. And I'm not saying that I'm going to be your coach, but it's just in me, it just oozes out of me naturally. Like if you say, okay, the next five years, I want to get my builder's license and I want to start a building business from my home office um, what should I be doing? And maybe we can talk a little bit about what you're doing, branding and marketing and on social media and, and you know, what your, what, your, what your ideas are around about establishing yourself as a business and a brand, as an authority in your area. And then, of course, how are you going about quoting and estimating? So I'm kind of like not offering coaching services, but I'm kind of offering coaching services. But um, yeah, it's, uh, that's sort of where we're at at the moment. Hope that helps, Josh. Thanks for your question.
Braden. Hey, Braden. Do you have any advice to ramp up lead generation in the early stages of the company? Yep. Look, I think what I would say before we jump to lead gen, gen Braden, is that what you want to make sure, and if I was having a chat with you, Braden, this is what I would say. I said, Braden, Braden tell me about your sales process. Because what if I could get you 30 leads this, this month? What would you do with them? And and I don't know where you're from, Braden, whether you're North America, which means you could be doing a lot of cost plus. If you're from from Oz, you'll be doing mostly fixed price. Kiwis kind of can do a bit of both. They, you know, they they sort of flip between the two depending on where you're at. So my 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 question to you would be: What is your sales process? Maybe what are you doing currently? Um, and then certainly around estimating, because there's no point in getting leads top of funnel if you don't have a sales process. And then if you are estimating incorrectly, that is going to go against you because. Profit is a natural byproduct of good good estimating. If you don't understand how to build shit in your head, you're not going to be able to estimate it and make the proper allowances. Therefore, you're going to gut yourself financially because the job costs you more time and money and then you're going to be dead in the water before you even get started. So see how all of this ties together. It's not like, I just need more leads. Now, if you're a gangster you know, estimator and you've got a sales process, okay, now we're ready. We can go and do it. I just would urge you, Braden, not... Not to put the cart before the horse. That's all I would say. And um, again, hit me up on email if you got some specifics. Because you know, this is what I, you guys and gals, I love the fact that you're you're bombing in here and, and chatting to us. Uh, you know, asking a few questions. But you know, really, what it comes down to, there is no one uh, thing fits all. Because for me, I, I I love to talk to people, which kind of be and because it, which means it makes me a good salesperson. Not because I can close a deal, but what I focus on is finding out what's important to you, the client, and I make it important to me. Now, if you said, look, Max, I really got to renovate this basement because I've got a couple of teenage kids and I need two bedrooms downstairs, that's one thing. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I'm a father of six. Um, so what I'm doing is building rapport, right? I'm father of six. Yeah, I can understand why you need the space. Then we start talking about the money side of it. And I'm like, well, what's your expectations? What do I need to build this for to make it comfortable for you? And so this is the process of, you know, really nailing down your process and finding out what some guys say to me, like, I, I just don't like talking to people. And I totally get that shit, right? Um, and so it, it really does, you've got to get to know yourself really intimately and understand what you love to do. I mean, you know, I would consider going into real estate because I love selling. Um, I sell franchises. I love that. I'm in construction. I love selling to retail. It's because I think that that selling is a very rewarding part of the process. Um, the challenge for us guys is, and gals as builders is that we've got a market to get inquiry. We've then got to do the pre-construction sales side of things. And then when we get it to contract, we've got to go build it. So those three phases of play can be terribly demanding. Matter of fact, working with Mike, one of my Smith & Sons general contractors on the tools this morning or today, he knows that he's compromising his uh, sales progress because he's out there. We're all trying to get this job closed out and finished and handed over. Um, and so we've got to go back to it for a couple of hours on Monday to finish it. But you, it, this is where you, you're sort of torn, right? Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that sort of helps out and gives you some, some clarity. Uh, cheers for the question. And that was, was that Braden? Yep, sweet as. Next. Mike, Michael. Mike, Michael? Michael. Michael. What, hey, Michael. What do you think about stepping outside of your area of expertise in a tougher market? Okay, I see, I would automatically need more more insight as to stepping outside. Okay, so for instance, what if I was into franchising like I am and I wanted to step out of selling franchises to, to general contractors or builders and go and sell real estate. I would say that that's probably something that you could do. Now, does that mean you could do both? I don't know because I kind of believe that man that chases two rabbits doesn't catch either of them. So that's a problem. So, you know, for me, it's like if I'm going to step out, I don't know whether you want to pursue that full time. But if I, if this if I was not going to sell franchises any longer, I would probably double down and spend three years building a franchise sales business because I know me. I don't have a problem working. Um, and so uh, this whole thing about, oh, it's 24, you know, 24-7, 365 type approach. I'm like, yeah, cool. I'm already doing it. So I um, hope that helps. He, he just uh, added yep. going from new builds into renos. Right. So his initial question was what? 
His initial question oh. was... I was trying to get context. What do you think about stepping ah, outside got it. of your area? Okay, that makes complete sense. Okay, so it's it's super simple. I come from a new home background initially. I did all my time, went from building, you know, 4,000 square foot homes or about 400 square meter homes, roughly, give or take, if you're uh, in the old metric system. And then we went uh, then we went into townhouses and then, of course, Phil's now in high-rises. But, um, yeah, going from, going from a new home build into renos... Uh, I think, I think that it's 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 more difficult, but it's what I like because when most builders that I know, even in this town, they're like, "Oh, I don't want to do renos." Why? Because you kind of got to have X-ray vision, um, and you've got to make more of an allowance. So your markup percentage in new homes will actually be less because you've got predictability in the new home build process. So if you wanted to jump straight from uh, doing new homes to renos and you were just going to use the same markup percentage, you would actually cost yourself money because what I would mark up when I'm doing an estimate for a reno is significantly greater than the markup that I would apply uh, doing a new home. So that's the straight straight away. That's the first thing that I would change up. And then what you've got to consider is in your, um, you know, in your development process of your build schedule, you've got to understand that, um, you know, renos can be cock up central for trade. So you don't just have a, a an electrician or a sparky go in and do a rough in and he's in and out. Matter of fact, one of the larger ones was about $150,000, $160,000 kitchen reno. Um, we actually uncovered a shit ton of damage to the wiring caused by uh, rats. So we had, there was an infestation there. So we had to time out on the rough in and go and fix and quote and, you know, so the time out on the job, well, we had to remedy that. So those sorts of things you don't have to, you don't come across in a new home. Um, but sure, there's some other things where there's some holdups, but certainly going into renos, yeah, you need to really just step back and, uh, you know, try and anticipate all of the things that are going to cost you time and money. Because if you don't, um, they will cost you time and money. So sweet. Sefa. Sefa. Hope we got that right. Yeah, I hope so. Because I'm just repeating what my guy's saying to me. <laughs> Let's go. How can I get my first commercial job, painting or tile? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I think about when I came to this this town eight years ago, um, and really I think what you've got to be, and so because I was a natural, it's funny, I would say I'm a natural pe people person, that's why I'm here doing Q&A, shooting from the hip, um, but don't get me wrong, when this show's done and after having worked eight hours on the tools, um, I'm ready to piss off home and just put my feet up. Um, but, but I think, um, you know what? I've forgotten the question. I, you felt me doing that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> just talking out of your ass. Oh, I was trying to get some freaking contacts. Relax. How, right. How can I get my first commercial? Yeah, job? right. So what I, what I was getting at, what I was getting at was, um, you got to go and just press the flesh. I think there's so much bullshit and bravado out there right now. If a guy walks in and talks to me, it's more likely that I'm going to give him a shot because I respect the friggin' the hustle, right? So if I was you I and you wanted to get into commercial and you want to do painting or tiling, I would go around all, and they're not hard to find. You, I mean, commercial sites are pretty huge. I would go around and just shake hands. As a matter of fact, I would probably harass some of the guys that are on there because what you're looking to do is just build a network and then at some point, if you shake the right hand, you might get lucky. He's like, well, matter of fact, I just had a painter, you know, had a tragedy in his family. He's he's having to, you know, basically go and take care of that. I'm, I'm out, I'm dead in the water with a painter. I'm happy to give you a shot. Like you just, the, the, the harder you work on that, the luckier you get, but it's all got to do with the volume of network. So like if, if I was to get into real estate, you've got to work your own um, sphere of influence. You're like, the people that you know are the going to be the ones that are going to be most likely to give you a go. So that's why, you know, it really pays to, to really not just do the lazy social media thing, although we're all about social, I get it. But what we've got to do is focus that at the end of the day, it is a human, it's a human to human business. It's not just, it's not electronic, it's not digital. So um, that's what I would do. I would definitely start out. Then then what you can do is you want to get emails. So you then want to have a really good uh, presentational proposal or a communication via email with the person maybe that you just spoke to. And then you can really, um, uh, you know, start to build off the back of that. So you've got to, and you can, it's not just going to uh, come to you in five minutes. You're not going to go out there 
and go, okay, let's go. Um, you'll get a job. It doesn't really happen that way. I'm not saying that it can't. It's just it's going to take a little bit of work to develop that as well. So hope that one helps. Joe. J-O-E. That's usually how you spell Joe. Just checking. All right. Joe, <laughs> let's go, Joe. <laughs> that's a, uh, he said, that's a great point. A lot of young men trying to get out too early on their own. That was re- uh, when you were talking about uh, apprenticeships oh, the, and yeah. stuff like that. Look, I just think you've got to have the maturity. I mean, as a 50-year-old old boy now, um, you know, when I get young whippersnappers, and I'm talking mid-20s young whippersnappers, that's what I deem to be. Like, you just know they haven't got the experience on the road. You just freaking... I remember when I was 25. It's scary. Um, you know, it's just like, dude, don't tell me. Like, I just... I don't have to guess. You'd want to be... Yeah, you, I mean, some of those guys are an exception to the rule. But anyway, so uh, that's... Uh, what's next, Dom? What do we got? Peter. Righto, Pete. Thanks for the question. Where do you lose the most money in the business? Okay, I would say, um, I would say if, if we're going to talk renos, I, I consider, I, I'm assuming we're talking construction business, I would say, um, in, and I'm going to talk from a reno standpoint, uh, I think, yeah, and you know what, it, it's more likely you'll lose money in a renovation project than on a new home project. Uh, so let's just go there because if people are going to think about getting into construction, I've actually got one guy in this town who is a new home builder, and he's spoken to me about two months ago about getting on board um, with uh, Smithies as a because he wants to get into Renos, right? Um, so, but it, it's more likely a oh, classic example, and I won't mention any names. But how's this? How's this when? Oh, actually, I better be careful. Um, so this is what can happen. We've been begging a certain supplier. To get our uh, to get yeah carpet installed on this project, and it's not a lot. It's two bedrooms and some stairs. So if he's listening, he'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so it's he sends he, the job's finished, and then he sends an estimate to the builders out like the Smith and Sons office, and says we need you to approve this estimate. And then one of my builders, and I was in the vehicle with him when he got it. He literally just flew off the handle. He's like, because he, I was driving and he was sort of checking emails and uh, he, he went and lost his friggin' mind. So I said, time out. I'll go talk to my other guy in town here and uh, I'll go and get a comparison and see if we can't uh, get a comparative quote. Anyway, long story short, over the counter, he gives me a quote that is less than half of what for the same exact product, the same scope of work, the same square footage or square meters, everything was the same. And this guy dead set gave me a quote for uh, three, and, gave three and a half grand less than, than what other guy. It was stupid. It was literally less than half price. And so now my builder's going, but it's now installed. But they sent him an, an estimate to be approved. And I said, do not approve that estimate. We got to have a chat because I've got a quote in my hand for the same product. So this is the stupid fun and games. And now was he was that supplier was being asked for a quote for weeks and weeks, if not months, and he never got round to it. We just trusted him and got the carpet installed. So kind of a bit of a cock up on our part because we didn't go and put together a PO. But if they had have quoted us two months ago and said it was going to cost us like six and a half grand, um, we would have basically said they can go and friggin' Pound, pound rocks because that's just too much. Anyway, so um, I, and for me personally, the other experience I've, I've had is I had an electrician who's, who we're still using today. Um, I had to do a, a bit of a job where I had to move the interior, get rid of the interior staircase and put in an elevator. Anyway, my electrician gave me a bit of a ballpark number of 1500 bucks to two grand, ended up costing me nearly four grand. Now, fortunately, I just thought that's way too cheap. So I used my, you know, street smarts if you like and i thought so i allowed something like three and a half grand and 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 his bill was around about that so if i didn't exercise that i would have lost thousands of dollars on that one scope of work so i think it's not one scope of work particularly it's the lack of detail that you get from your particularly your subcontractors but sometimes your supplies like we did and without getting that because everything's got to be po'd guys now I think I just did a podcast. Did I just do a podcast with POs and subcontracts? That's literally yeah. the one that dropped yesterday. Yep. So episode one, 131, I talk about the difference between purchase orders and subcontracts. 
And I was always for one, I just give POs to suppliers and subcontractors, but the subcontractors is also pretty important. So check that one out. Um, and so, you know, it's really important that you nail your numbers because this bullshit goes on. So this supplier is going to go, well, well, we've already installed it. So you've got to pay the price that we give you. The problem was his retail price was was over double what the retail, the retail price was for the other guys. So I said to, to my guy, I said, you walk in, you talk to that supplier and I'm going to be standing right behind you, bite my tongue because I am dying to come over the top at him. If he tries any sort of bullshit, I'm like right there. And that's what they do. So, you know, you've got to have your own understanding of what is an acceptable budget for a set scope of work and material. Uh, and that takes some time. This is why, how the hell can you have what I've got at 25 years of age? You know why? Because you haven't cocked it up as much as I have. That's what gives me the experience. So there you go. I don't know which question that was led out with, but anyway, Jeez. make for a good podcast, folks. Remember, that's what we're doing. This is all. This is the podcast we're shooting right now. So uh, we're going to do this every other week, and I love it. Right on. Jackson. Okay, Jackson, thanks for your question, champ. What's your thoughts on buying a business already developed? Uh, I'm going to assume he's. Uh, I actually he could be. He could be a more mature individual. I don't know how old he is, mate. I I don't think you, there's no the goodwill that's associated with a building company. Now I sell franchises for a living, right? So I am selling uh, construction systems to general contractors or builders. So I know a little bit about the dynamics therein. But the, the thing is, we have an international brand. You could jump on uh, social media and find Smith & Sons Remodeling Experts Canada. And of course, you could find Smith & Sons Renovations and Extensions in New Zealand. And you could find Smith & Sons Renovations and Extensions in Australia. And collectively, there's over 100 general contractors that are a part of the Smith & Sons group. Now, we have over a decade of experience in um, you know the systemized approach to construction specifically renovations and remodeling so there's there's and then of course you know you in, in canada you're going to be dealing with me so um you know there's some upside around that so there's a lot of skills that um, you can develop with and get a bit of air cover so for you to go and buy a business i it would depend on what it is that you're looking to buy and how much they're charging for that and what is the transition agreement? In other words, does that builder or general contractor stay working for you for 12 months and help you drive the business, you know, in to in the handoff process? Um, you know, what's their what's their social media like? Like I want to see, okay, if I you it's all about ROI. What return on investment am I getting? And that's a good place to start. Hope that helps. I'm gonna try and get out of here in in half an hour, eh? You're gonna wrap this up in three minutes? No. Oh shit, what time is it? No, 4.30. No? My phone says 4.04, bro. Oh, I've, I've been rolling for... Oh, shit. No, okay. <laughs> anyway. Let's go. Uh, G-Dog. G-Dog. Yeah. Why don't you just build houses and sell them? How should I answer this G-Dog question? G-Dog, because I'm getting old. And, uh, you know, there's there's probably a part of me... And I've, I've had some challenges with some of my general contractors, there's no question. But the guys that really get it and the guys that are good humans and have good skills and are teachable, it's a very rewarding business. Um, there's no question that in a, in a heartbeat, I could go out on my own. But in this town of 40,000 people, I've got, I've got three general contractors under the Smith & Sons brand. So I don't really want to go into competition with those guys. Um, but the minute, you know, my guy in this office said to me, hey, I've, my PM's walking out, I need some help. I'm like, I'm your guy. So I, I do enjoy it. But I, you know, from a business standpoint and from a wealth creation standpoint, I've chosen to go this route. Um, and that's that's probably why. You know, you've heard, you know, dad always used to say to you, well, you know, get a trade to fall back on, all that sort of shit. Um, whereas, you know, for me, it's it's there and I can, you know, do it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm demonstrating my skills as a carpenter building a chicken coop at the home at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, like I could go and do that. But yeah, I'm really committed to this um, physically and financially. And also, I think there's a lot of reward that comes to me that money can't really buy. Um, but hopefully in the next five years, yeah, it'll, it'll set me up pretty well. So um, it's a very different type of business model and one I'm sort of really grateful to be involved in. There you go. Joe? 
Hey, Joe, same Joe or different Joe? I think Joe? it's the same Joe. Okay. Uh, I recently started my own carpentry business. What would be the best way to help bring more work in? Yeah, it's funny. You know, as a carpenter, and I had about 15 guys working in about, uh, what, five crews up and down, you know, southeast corner of Queensland. And getting work as a carpenter wasn't terribly difficult. But making money with those carpentry crews, oh, geez, it was hard because understand this, that when builders like me and my guys, essentially what we do to carpenters is the rates are set because we, we, we know what the retail marketplace buys your labor for. And we have to buy, and that's retail, but we have to buy you at wholesale and make money so we can sell you at retail. And so what that really, that did to me is it, it's like I was taking all this risk and I was putting, you know, guys on and blah, blah, blah. And it was just so hard to make a dime because their, the rates were so, were cut so shy because they were, they were basically uh, buying your labor at wholesale. So what I would encourage, I think if I spoke to myself, oh, geez, yeah, it would have been 25 years ago now, and I had the same goal as to build, a, you know, a carpentry type service business to, to builders. Now, if you're build, if you're dealing maybe with homeowners, that's a slightly different story because then you could sell your labour at retail. Um, whereas if you're subcontracting for a builder, know this that they are going to be buying you at wholesale rate and selling you at retail. That's the arbitrage. That's how they make money. So, look, what I would encourage you to do if you're in that position where you're working for a builder. Again, and you've got and you want you're a business guy or gal, and you want to make money, and you want to kind of go and operate your own business. I would encourage you to steal with your eyes and ears, and look and listen, and ask questions, ask questions, and build alliances with other builders, so that you can you know get the information out of them about hey, what's tough about being a builder? Hey, what do you find your biggest challenges about operating a building company in this town? Like those sorts of things will start to give you a bit of a landscape or some perspective around how you get, you want to go and, you know, live your life as a business person. And, and this is why some, most, a lot of people, I don't know what the percentage is, but probably, you know, shit, 70% of people work for, uh, you know, work for somebody because there is, mate, there is so much stress associated with running a business. Um, uh, this aspects, there's times where I think about stuff at night going to bed when I shouldn't be and it does stop me from going to sleep. There's no question. You worry about all kinds of stuff. I've got five general contractors and I'm worrying about the lead gen. I'm worrying about their ability to, to convert deals. Um, you know, I'm worried about all kinds of dynamics uh, within my business. And so, you know, that is what's unseen. We just think, oh, we're going to go into business and make money from the get-go. And then what happens when you get on a job and you lose five grand, you know, and the whole job is only worth 10 grand? because you, you got guys that were just wasting your time and you didn't. Now, just side note, just so you know, I just felt to say this, but um, I know that the, the, the reason a lot of builders fail uh, and the, the, the phrase which has come out of my experience, you know, back in Queensland was that um, it's the lack of supervision. And I've seen it here as well. The guys tell you how good they are, then they go out on site and they tell you they're doing a good job until you get there and realise they're doing a pretty freaking awful job. And so guys and gals, um, it's the lack of supervision I, you know, for a new guy, we've got a new guy started for one of my guys. He's not a bad little carpenter by the looks of it so far, but I will be on his job site every day for the next three weeks. I, I will just will bug the shit out of him. Not that I don't trust him. I just, you know, you tell me you play a good game. All right, well, then show me. And if it's at my standard, then we'll keep doing business. If not, I will have to let you go. Simple as that. So, um, righto, let's go. E Emmanuel. Hey, Emmanuel. Thanks for your question. What skills slash skills would you say has helped you the most since your carpentry apprenticeship? Yeah, I think, was that question skills slash skills? What skill yep. slash skills? Oh, right. So like what yep. skills? Yep. I think, I think uh, you're welcome, Joe. Um, look, I, there's no question because I never went, you know, I've got business cards with CEO written on it, you know, like it's kind of the biggest wank. But anyway... Um, it's what my job is to build a business, simple as that, no different to yours. Um, but I think right back in the early days, I mean, I remember riding my pedal bike probably 15, 20 minutes to wash my uncle's trucks for 10 bucks a piece. And then I would go home with 20 bucks in my pocket and I'm like, rock star. So that, that was, uh, shit, I was still in elementary school doing that. So, um, you know, I think it comes down to, what you what you want to do and what gets your attention and what you love to do and then i ended up working at a gas station which i was really bad at um 
but I just, I wanted to get to the money. But what that did is it set the foundation that when I knew, when I probably recognized in the early days how hard it was to make money. Uh, and some guys and gals make it look easier, but I think for the majority of us, it's an absolute frigging grind. So what I what I probably understood from an early, I, I was not, I, I didn't, and I think I've said this before on shows before, but, you know, I don't think I, I don't think I ever really, you know, was a first place individual a lot of the time. But what I did recognize and what I enjoyed was that I love competition and I am a competitor, which makes me an irritation to my competition because I never quit. So that's a little bit of the subtle side of my personality because I want to quit and I talk like I want to quit, but I can't quit. And I think that kind of resolve, you know, you know what what is that saying? Winners never quit and quitters never win. And that that's kind of, I guess, now I got involved, and this, this might be just an interesting bit of trivia for you, but I got involved with a network marketing company and they don't really have a really good, uh, good reputation. But what, I, what was drilled into me even back in my early 20s was the, the power of self-improvement, understanding that education uh, and the six inches between your ears was what was going to determine whether you're going to be successful or not. Uh, that, really, that kind of culture that around business development really got ingrained. And I think from an early day, uh, early stage, I did not <clears throat> overrate my intelligence or my importance or I definitely wasn't entitled. I knew I was going to have to actually, you know, get my sword out and slay dragons to make this happen forever. Um, you know, so I, I think it was that it was that resolve. But I really, a I love construction, but I was really, I was really. Uh, energized and excited by business systems that worked. More recently, I you know I loved watching uh, John Taffer, and he was he would he would uh, run a show called Bar Rescue, and he would walk into some pubs and bars, and they were an absolute shit show, and the business was run by operators who had no clue, and they couldn't under, and you know they had couldn't understand why the business was spending so much money on alcohol and wasn't making money, um, and those and then of course um, who's the other guy Gordon Ramsay. You know, um, and love him or hate him. Then there was the Apprentice. Those kinds of things where I'm like, this is not just about me being a really good carpenter, and I think I'm okay at being a carpenter. But there was so much more around. If I'm going to take a technical skill set and monetize that and convert it, there was so much more. So you know, in the boardroom next door here, you know, I, I set out as many books as can fit across my four foot boardroom table as I can fit there. And there's, there's all kinds of different books that are there, but there's a lot of autobiographies, or sorry, a lot of biographies, probably in autobiographies. Um, there's a lot of self-help type books, and it was all about educating. Now I do it with podcasts. I listen to podcasts. I listen, and I listen to audio books because there's always, it's just, the, more, the, the further I go, the more I realize how much I don't know. And so you really, you know, guys and gals, you know, success in business, it's so, it's so few and far between because I hang around a lot of successful business guys and I hear their stories. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that comes too easy. So I don't think there is a skill or skills. I think, I think probably work ethic is one. Doing something that you love is another. Having a high level of self-awareness is, is certainly a, a pillar of success. Those are the components when put together are really going to set the foundation within you as a person that's going to help you develop your business. Because most people I know uh, who have put together a massive business have worked their frigging heart out and they have, you know, I think in the last 12 months, here's the deal for you guys and girls, you want to know what skill or skills is going to help you develop a business, your ability to come back from a loss, a big loss. And I'm telling you, my last 12 months, I could tell you stories that have turned your bloody hair green and it, it really makes me sad because... We achieved so much in this business and, and then we experienced some losses that were significant. And it, I'm just really like, you couldn't, have, you couldn't have told me in Christmas at 2021, Christmas time, what my 2022 was going to look like. It was devastating. And yet, I don't know who says it. I think there's a, an, an NFL coach that says this, that a setback is a set up for a comeback. And so here comes all of the bullshit talk about stickability and grit and determination and quitters never, you know, quitters never win and winners never quit, all that sort of stuff. 
Now, this we can talk it. You know, I hear some. I you know, even I go onto Spotify, and um, I've got uh, <laughs> I've got one one uh, a playlist that's called Hard as Fuck, and it's all about you know, it's um, who's the guy? His name starts with E. I can see his face. Uh, it'll come to me, but it's it's just this motivational type speaking because every day I've got to get my head in the right space all the time, every day because it is such a slog and such a grind. And I've talked about how the the overwhelm that can that can beat you down um, is you're right on the threshold of success. And I have got my fair share of overwhelm, I can assure you. But every day when the sun goes down, I just I exercise a lot of gratitude. I'm thankful for my what I've got in my life that is good. And then I try and get six hours sleep and then I wake up the next day and I get after it again. Cheers. That's all I can do. And that's all you can do. Okay. You, that was a pretty long answer. User. Uh, he said, Hey, what do you think subby rates are at the moment? Uh, mate, it depends on he didn't give us a country, did he? No, not yep. a country. Yeah. Look, I, you know, in uh, in Australia, you know, I don't know what the rates are now, but in Canada, I can tell you for for a decent a decent decent carpenter on on payroll, right? So you've got all the different source deductions or whatever you guys call them, and and you know, holiday pay and everything goes along with it. But a good a good guy will end up costing the company, you know, close to forty five bucks an hour. Which means he might be taking, you know, he might be making 35, 38 bucks an hour gross. So, but that's that's a guy working for you full time. Subby rates, it really is different. So, subby rates on cookie cutter homes will be different. Uh, subby rates for carpenters, let's just talk carpenters, we'll just talk one trade. Subby rates on cookie cutter homes where they're so repetitive, the rates are going to be fairly low, but the high, the amount of work that you'll work through um, and the fact you don't have to do any marketing will be good. Um, you know, so there's opportunity there without having to do any marketing and you're just constantly getting it. But that's a big volume builder because they're what they're doing, they're appealing to the larger proportion of people in the marketplace where though they don't have the most amount of money. And then you can, you know, but subby rates like for us, uh, I know that the, one of the guys that I started giving a plug to, old Doug, he's a interiors guy, you know, paint a drywall, perhaps ceiling texture and whatever. He, we, he is not the cheapest, but oh my word, does he give awesome service. He communicates excellently and is excellently a word. It, and and so it's about service and value for us as builders. And we're working for some fairly well-heeled clients. We do not need to get dicked around by subbies. We need guys that say when they're going to be there, they're going to be there. And when they say they're going to be finished, they're going to be finished. That gives my scheduling program a lot of predictability which i like and of course the quality of work is good so that guy's a good human and he is a uh, you know he's he's not the cheapest but he and he does good work so what that enables me to do is to get jobs when i make promises to clients uh he gets shit done on time and that makes me look good and i appreciate that so subby rates is a little you really you really got to do a lot of work in your own own ecosystem and just start asking questions, but make sure the work that you're going to do, you're asking questions of builders that do the same sort of work. Don't get, you know, talk about apples with apples, right? Next question. This is the last question that I have yep. from our viewers. Okay. Uh, Emmanuel. Emmanuel's back. Yep. When would you look at giving the job at a 25-year-old or over someone older? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, we, we talked about one of the guys, CVM was talking about, he's working on one of the, one, he's working on a building site right now uh, on the south side of Brisbane for the guy that I did my apprenticeship with between 89 and 93. Um, and, you know, it, it by the time he was 30, he was a millionaire. Fact, like for real. So it, there's it's just not, he's very uncommon. Like his type of individual, his old man was a builder, but he wasn't rocking it the way Phil was rocking it. So, it, like, it's possible. There's no question. But it really, you just, it would, it would be a case of I would need to meet you and, and just talk a bit about what you're doing and then, you know, we would make that consideration. So I wouldn't say it's not possible at all. You know, like, sometimes we'll hire on attitude and then we'll try and teach the skills so, like, when I'm talking to builders about becoming a franchised operator with Smithies, I, there's a lot of things. I want to know that you've got a good work ethic. Of course I do. But I want to know you're teachable as well. I want to know that you have the ability to build rapport. 
um, you know, and you're relatable. Like there's a whole bunch of things that kick in. And I kid you not, dude, there is, I mean, you sound like you're a decent dude. Um, you, I would I would hire you. Uh, there's one guy I've got in my mind and you're as a 25 year old I would, and he's 57. I would hire you over him all day because he's a dick and he's dishonest and he's a slime bag. And my guy over the other side of the camera knows exactly who I'm talking about. So it is, it's 100% possible. It is absolutely consideration. But you as a young buck, you would just want to start understanding that, you know, it is hard for you to cut in and to get in amongst it, but it's not impossible, right? It, there is, a, there's a part of it, there's a timing thing where you can get pretty lucky and you're like, hey, I've got this job with this really great company. So um, thanks for the question. Okay, I got a couple of statements and then another question. Okay, let's go with some Emmanuel stuff. said, you put so much value out to the world. Thank you for doing what you're doing. You're welcome, Emmanuel. And everyone is more than welcome. It makes me happy. It's my oxygen. Okay. I'm going to butcher this name. Majidzik? Right. I don't know. Uh, I'm putting... uh, is that mullet? No, no. No, okay. You sure? Okay. Let's go. <laughs> There's a Majidzik mullet, mullet. Oh, yeah. I cut, cut off the last bit for me, but... Right um, I'm putting dollars aside to come to Canada for a working holiday to work 11 years, or, yeah, working a holiday. Yeah. He worked 11 years experience in New Zealand to work for Smith & Sons for a couple weeks. So he's wanting to work for Smithies here or? In Canada. Well, you want to make sure you either go to Victoria on the on Vancouver Island or Nanaimo uh, on, Victoria, uh, on Vancouver Island. Um, or this hometown of mine here, which is Vernon, BC, Vernon, British Columbia, because uh, I don't have any builders anywhere else. So, um, but look, dude, it's 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 hit and miss. I mean, like, be good to meet you, shake your hand, have a beer, um, and maybe give you a shot. Any one of my guys will probably give you a shot, but they know that there's no guarantees. If you're not if you, if you're not a good human and got good skills, then you're not going to work out for us. So he said he wants to work for you directly to get the most out of it. Right, mate. Looks like you're moving to Vernon, and I'm telling you, make sure you got a plan B because, yeah, we keep keep a pretty high standard. But it's just because, and the reason we do that is not because like I got to have a high standard because I'm a, whatever. No, it's because our clients are so demanding. We have to be absolutely clinical. We must be assassins in the building game so that our product delivery is on point. Because if it is not on point, the clients will will kick my ass. Will kick our ass. There's no question. So. Mate, I'm not going to promise you anything. I can't do that, dude. I don't know you from Adam. But, dude, if you rock up here and my you, our office address is on our – it's on our TikTok profile. It's on our website. Is it? I think it's on our TikTok profile as well, dude. Anyway, Either it's on way. the website, on our B4B website. On our business. Definitely on our Smithies. Oh, you can go to our Smith & Son. Dude, you can walk in my office. Like, you can literally get on a plane. And within two days, you can literally walk in my office. But that would be Sunday. I may not be here. Um – yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Like you could be the right guy. Like it'd be it'd be a freaking gangster freaking story if you did do that and you worked out. Like awesome. I love I love those good news stories. Those good news shows. That's awesome. So um, just like I said, man. My my emails max at businessforbuilders.ca or you can go to businessforbuilders.ca. Hit the contact form. I'm not saying we can do anything for you, but if you're running your own building company and you you focus on quality. Kudos, like you'll fit in just fine. But as long as you're not bullshitting me. Just saying. Okay, this is my nah. last question that I have. Yeah. Ali, uh, yep. where can one get bids from contractors slash trades in Canada? He's in the greater Toronto yep. area. So he's on the East Coast. We're on the West Coast. Yeah. Mate, you've got to, you've, I tell you what, the guy that I just keep banging on about, old Doug, the interior guy, I literally Googled uh, painters in Vernon. Send, enter. And I checked out his website and then his phone manner was really good. He told me a little bit about what he was, you know, who he'd work for. He'd work for some of the restoration companies. So there is no, there's no one. You've got to go find him. You can go to social media and find, just put in the search term, painter GTA, tile setter GTA, drywall GTA. Or you can go to Google, do exactly the same thing. Then you've got to get on the phone and start working. Because guess what? They're not like... They're not going to trust you because they don't know who you are. You're going to have to actually go in and probably buy the work. In other words, look at the jobs, do, do it for a bit cheaper, then, then to get a little bit of access and to be able to demonstrate your value. 
And, uh, and then at that point, you might have some street cred. So this is a building process, no different to a bricklayer. And this is what I think, this is what I need your mental picture guys to, to, to start considering when you're talking about building a, a business, it's like, how does a bricklayer build a wall? One brick at a damn time, but he makes sure that it's straight and it's level and it's plumb, okay? So you've got to build a business with the same patient attitude. A bricklayer doesn't go and lay a thousand blocks, uh, a thousand bricks in, in one hour. You know, he might only lay 600 bricks a day. I don't know, maybe there's some gangster bricklayers that'll, out there. But you know what I'm saying? This is a building process. So you might devote maybe five or six hours a week to reaching out and touching base with, uh, you know, subs in your area, of which you'll probably get 90% of them completely ignore you. I know I get a shit ton of emails from people. I'm just like, next. I, I just haven't got the strength to, to deal with people trying to, you know, promote to me their services because I may not be looking for it. However, there is one guy in Saskatoon who I'm talking to about SEO for our website. And he just hit me up out of the blue and he gave me some good value. So I keep talking to him. So, um, yeah, you got to understand, you know, what your best bet is. So, um, yeah, mate, there's no real easy way to do that. It's just a grind. Work. Get creative and reach out and uh, do a lot of it. That's what I would say. Hope you enjoyed that, folks. Uh, don't forget, email me, max at businessforbuilders.ca. Don't forget to get across to our uh, Facebook, private Facebook group, Business for Builders VIP. And uh, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate the folks that dropped these questions. I uh, hope that helped you out a lot. Go build a kick-ass business. See you on the next episode. Cheers. How old are you going to be before you start to experience life like you want it? I want to tell you right now, whether you like it or not, there is a better way to do business.